guys, it's Heather from Psychology of Superheroes. Today we're going to be talking about Jason Todd. He's one of the, the Robins for Batman, but we're actually going to be focusing on his alias Red Hood. If you want some more information about Jason during his time as Robin, I'll link my previous article where I focused on that, but today we're really just going to be focusing on his time as Red Hood, his time after his death. This podcast episode was recommended by Writers Blocked Mine. So Writers Blocked Mine, thank you. I I really hope that you're going to enjoy this episode. I have a number of different Red Hood storylines that we're going to be looking at today. And the first one is Red Hood Lost Days. Now this is the story of the time between Jason's death and the Joker killed him and when he returned as the Red Hood. There's a number of years in between his death and when Batman meets up with him again and he's the Red Hood. So Jason has died. He claws his way out of his coffin. There's no real explanation in this storyline for how he came back from the dead. There is an explanation. It's a little convoluted, but it doesn't get into, this storyline doesn't get into it. So he claws his way out of his coffin and Raja Ghoul finds him just kind of wandering around and he's totally jacked, more so than when he was Robin. Raja Ghoul is interested in how Jason cheated death, but he doesn't tell Batman that he's found his dead Robin. So even though, you know, he just, Jason just went through this death, he's still, a, he's a total athlete. He's a warrior, but he's almost brain dead. It's said about him he's not responsive to any human contact except when he's attacked and then some sort of muscle memory kicks in. That muscle memory of being a warrior, that net warrior training that Batman gave him, that's still there but he's not talking, he's not he's not interacting with the world except in a violent way. It's also said about him he eats, he covers himself when he's cold but seems to have no sense of the world. They use the term it's an autistic effect brought upon by his brain damage. By now, I had hoped that his brain would have begun utilizing other undamaged cells and he'd become more cognizant. So, Raja Ghul is making the point that due to his, his actual death and somehow coming back from the dead, the cells of Jason's brain, the ones that have to do with like language, problem solving abilities, basically the prefrontal cortex or the frontal lobe of his brain, he doesn't think that it's, it's working so much. But Raja Ghul does know about, he does know about brain plasticity. So he's hoping that the part of the Jason's brain that hasn't been damaged will kind of take on the job of the prefrontal cortex, but he's not seeing that. But his daughter, Raja Ghul's daughter, Talia, kind of makes like, she makes an emotional connection with Jason. She seems to care about him. And she makes the point that Jason won't hit her back. If she, if she slaps him, he doesn't respond violently. If someone else were to slap him, he does. So her conclusion is that he he must recognize her. But Raja Ghul, her father, isn't really buying this. He says he is and forever will be an unthinking, emotionless shell. But that's kind of inconsistency because Talia begins talking about Batman to Jason while he is still supposedly this brain dead, unthinking, emotionless shell. She's talking about Batman and Jason starts crying. So Talia is pretty sure that Jason can be rehabilitated. So what she decides against Raja Raja Ghoul's judgment, she decides to dump Jason into the rejuvenating Lazarus pit. If you don't know about that, the Lazarus pit is where Raja Ghoul submerges himself and it gives him healing powers. This is how he's been able to live for centuries. So she she uses the same pit that her father uses in hopes to rehabilitate Jason. It does rejuvenate Jason, but Raja Ghoul then thinks that it may turn him mad. The powers of the Lazarus pit may turn him mad. So Jason has has been rejuvenated and he learns that the Joker is still alive, that Batman has not avenged his killer. And I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure why Jason is surprised. In my very personal opinion, he always knew that Batman has a no-killing code, but I guess he thought that he would violate that for him, for his own killer. So I guess maybe he just didn't understand how strong that no killing code is. So he believes, Jason believes that he has a mandate to kill Batman. And here, here in my opinion is what's really going on with Jason. He's hurting. He died, Jason died, and he feels like Batman didn't care that he died. 
sad. So he's feeling unloved. He's feeling betrayed. And then when he finds out later on that Batman got a new Robin, he feels used. So he sets up a trap to kill Batman. It's actually a pretty brilliant trap based on his knowledge of Batman's strategies. He sets up a trap, but he doesn't kill Batman. He he kind of comes up with an excuse that it wouldn't be as satisfying, that he wants to kill Batman more personally. I think he doesn't actually want to kill Batman at all. I think he wants to express to Batman that I am hurt. And the only way that he can do that is to meet with him face to face. So he kind of works that out in his own mind. I need to kill him more personally. So someone in this storyline refers to Jason as sociopathic because he cares so much about his revenge. We're going to get to later on in the episode after we go through all these different storylines that I want to talk about. We'll talk about whether or not Jason actually meets the criteria for for the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, which is the actual diagnosis. Sociopath isn't actually a diagnosis. It's just a term that society uses. So next, after this, he finds out that he, Batman has quote unquote moved on in Jason's mind and he decides that he wants to kill him more personally. Jason starts training under various men or various assassins to become a killer. It's actually very similar to the time Bruce Wayne spent abroad in order to become Batman. Before Bruce became the Batman, he spent a lot of time traveling the world and studying to have the skills to be as effective as he is. But Jason is learning more deadly skills. Jason discovers that one of his assassin teachers, Egon, is actually stealing children in a slave trade. He's stealing the children and then selling them to the slave trade. So Jason is not about to have this. Jason saves the kids, kills off all of the mercenaries. So we're going to get to this a little bit more later, but here's my question. Can someone be a sociopath or a psychopath if he or she still has a sense of morality? Now Jason no longer thinks of Egon as a human. He's he's dirt to him because he's doing something so heinous as kidnapping children and selling them. So on one hand, you know, he has no problem killing people or even thinking of them no longer as human, but he has a sense of morality in you don't do this to children. And he he makes the justification to kill him. He knew that Egon had enough connections to get out of the legal system. If he did it Batman's way, Egon would have eventually just gotten out of jail and would have just been backed to kidnapping the kids, selling them into the slave trade. So in Jason's mind, he solved the problem by just killing him. And so after this instance, Jason starts taking out who he considers bad guys, and they're mostly his teachers. So he's learning from them. He's learning these very deadly strategies, techniques. But as he learns more about his teachers and the crimes that they commit using these strategies, he begins to kill them off. Even though in my mind, there are very blatant similarities. Jason insists that he is not like Bruce, that he is not like Batman at all. I really think there is. Like I said, he begins his journey very much like Batman in that he's he's taking this time to study and to become more efficient at what he wants to do. And he still has a sense of morality. He still judges criminals and crime the same way, but his tactics are different. That's what separates him from Batman. So at this point, he, that's when he finds out Batman has a new Robin. He gets very upset about this. So I'm, I'm thinking that he's feeling like Batman has forgotten him and just moved on. So again, he's still having emotional responses to this idea that Batman betrayed him, that he doesn't love him the same way that Jason loved him while he was Robin. So Jason starts doing some various missions. He's a very sarcastic, funny, disrespectful guy. To me, he actually kind of, he reminds me of Deadpool. But at this point, he's not doing the whole thing with a mask and a costume. He's just going about as Jason, taking out these these assassins that he's learning from. But this one guy that he is about to kill says that he knows where Jason's killer, the Joker, is. So Jason spares him. He has a flashback. Jason remembers Batman briefing him on the Joker, telling him not to underestimate him as merely insane. So that was while he was first as a Robin. But now Jason's old and now he's hunting down the Joker. He finds the Joker, he ties him up, soaks him in gasoline, and is about to light him on fire. But again, the same way that he had Batman in a trap, he could have just blown him up. Jason stops. He says that it's not enough. So he had the opportunity to kill his killer, do what he he wanted Batman to do, but 
but he doesn't go through with it. He tells Talia that he wants all three of them to be together. I don't, like, he really wants this to be some kind of emotional reunion. And again, I think it's, again, it's, it goes back to Jason's problem isn't that the Joker is alive, in my opinion. His problem isn't that Batman is alive. His solution really is not to kill both of them. He thinks that it is, but I think unconsciously Jason's real motivations that he can't admit to at this point is that he is, he just wants to tell Batman how he's feeling. So Talia tells him, if you really want to make Batman pay, punish him instead of killing him. Be a better Batman than Batman is. Take away the thing that is most precious to Batman, to Bruce Wayne, and that is Gotham. So at this point, Talia says that Batman has killed her father. That must be in a different storyline, but she mentions it. Jason also suspects that Talia doesn't want him to kill Batman because she actually has a thing for him, whatever. And then at this point, Jason and Talia sleep together. What? That's weird. I didn't see that one coming, but apparently it's a thing. All right. But this particular series ends with Jason holding up the, the iconic Red Hood mask. So that's Red Hood, the lost days. This is just, it's a filler story in between that time when he's died and when he comes back to Gotham as the Red Hood. And I really, I like it, even though it has some plot holes to it. Like it doesn't explain how Jason is alive at all, but I like it in that it explains or touches on a lot of Jason's motivations. There's this other storyline that I read. I really wanted to get a feel for what's going on with Jason. And if you want to diagnose somebody, or if you think that they can be diagnosed with a personality disorder, you really need to get a lot of information because a personality disorder, it describes that person's main pattern of behavior over their lifetime, really, over their adult lifetime. So the next one that I'm going to look at is Batman Battle for the Cowl. I didn't really care for it so much. I thought Damien was a little weird in this storyline, but this is really beside the point. It talks a lot about Jason. So in the first issue of Batman Battle for the Cowl, apparently Batman is dead. And because Batman is dead, Gotham is even worse off than it has always been. And nobody, none of the Robins, want to take up the cowl, the mantle of being the Batman. But somebody starts being a fake Batman and they are more ruthless. And obviously you can tell this must be Jason. So Jason, as the new Batman, says, then I came along. I had a different philosophy. I didn't like being constrained by Batman's ideology. I thought lessons should be learned, examples made. I never desired to be his enemy, only his eventual replacement and that time has come. So Jason has always wanted, he's always wanted to be Batman's son and his heir. He thought as a Robin, eventually Bruce will retire as Batman, I'll take over. But he died and he was replaced. And Batman also had a lot of issues with how Jason got the job done. So even though he had this idea in his head, I'm gonna be Batman's eventual replacement, he began to see Batman didn't actually want that and he resented that. So Jason fights Nightwing, Dick Grayson, and Damien, and he refers to some lives as meaningless. Again, like in The Lost Days, he refers to Egon as not even being human. So he's able in his mind to put people into categories, those whose lives matter and those who don't. Similarly to Batman, he uses an element of fear, but he also uses guns, which Batman doesn't do. He expresses that he wishes Bruce had stayed an urban legend, that he had never talked to Jim Gordon, that he had never talked, that he had never taken on any Robins. Jason believes that when when Batman took on Robins, like in, in some ways Batman told himself, I am giving these guys a home that they don't have and I'm giving them a mission, a purpose in life and rehabilitating them or you know, giving them a parental figure. But but from Jason's point of view, he thought that by taking children and training them to fight crime and taking them out on the streets, Batman was being selfish. Which, all right, I can't really argue with that, Jason. You make a kind of a good point there. But Tim Drake puts on the Batman suit and he goes to challenge Jason in his own Batcave. So Jason has taken on the mantle of Batman, much more sinister Batman. He's created his own Batcave. And while Tim is going to confront Jason, he meets up with Catwoman 
and Jason fights them both. And he says to Tim, and I kind of love this line, but he says to Tim, but the game is only just beginning. That's right, boy wonder, follow me. This is my playground. To me, this actually sounds like something that the Joker would say. He even laughs really oddly like the Joker during his fight, and Tim calls him a psychopathic killer. So I think it's really interesting. Maybe Jason has always wanted to become Batman. But let me know what you guys think. You can contact me and find articles, podcasts, and videos at psychologyofsuperheroes.tumblr.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. You can also contact me on Twitter at Psych Superheroes. And please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash psychologyofsuperheroes. Thanks, guys. And I'll see you later.